Hey, how's it going? Um, welcome. I'm going to give a maybe a, a couple seconds to, for people to come in. Um, this is my first time doing hosting one of these events via YouTube and Zoom, so please forgive me for any potential awkwardness. Um, but I'm glad to virtually host this on behalf of Red Emma's, and I'm also very glad uh, to be hosting this event for. Uh, uh, one of the favorite, one of my favorite members of the Red Emma's community, and I very much do consider him part of the Red Emma's community um, as someone who has been writing, writing his works at the store, has been doing talks and events uh, for several years now. Uh, he first was introduced to me by another friend and writer from Baltimore, uh, Dwight uh, D. Watkins. And uh, he brought him at one of his events. He he brought. He's like, I got this friend, and uh, I want to. I want him to speak beforehand. I want him to uh, set it off. And that uh, was Kanjwani, and he did a spoken word piece, uh, and that was his main focus at the time. But over the past couple of years, and after having published uh, a book of, you know, prose poetry, uh, and then a, another one of essays you know this is going to be his first one with a major publisher with major distribution and um it's called the anti-racist and it does um it does mix together uh, the various styles that kanjwani has been working on uh, over the past few years you will find poetic aspects to it uh it, there are essays but th there's reflection there's biography um, but it's also making uh, intellectual and political arguments. And uh, I'm really glad to, that Kandwani has entered, entered uh, this discussion and entered this conversation with this book because uh, while I think there's value to the conversations that people are having at every level, uh, you know, including in the more, uh, you know, what we might call mainstream outlets, uh, that people are discussing anti-racism, uh, that often it's uh, discussed in a very uh, abstract and uh, I'd say class blind way. And many of the people are having the conversations are speaking about, um, you know, they're speaking to their, uh, their worlds and their milieus, which are often corporate, bureaucratic, political. And so therefore the solutions uh, and even the, the modes of interaction that they encourage and foster are related to that kind of class, um, that kind of class outlook, and so to see someone, uh, you know, you know, very much uh, from this city, uh, who came up, uh, you know, through through a very difficult experience, and and has nonetheless, uh, you know, emerged as his voice, and it's it's a great thing to see. So. Uh, that said, um, he is joined tonight uh, by Wallace Lane, who's another author who I met through Dee Watkins. And uh, so again, I just want to give a lot of respect to Dee uh, for everything he does as well. But, um, you know, Wallace did his uh, book event for the book Jordan Year, uh, which you can also find on the Red Emma's website. Uh, we do have a couple copies. Um, uh, he's a, a friend and colleague of uh, Kandwani's, and so he's going to be uh, talking Kandwani through uh, the book. And then, uh, so that's going to be about, I don't know, say about 20 minutes or so. And then after that, we'll have time for some questions. Uh, and uh, we're going to have a link for this, uh, this book, uh, The Anti-Racist. And we do have signed copies available. So I think we've got at least, um, you know, 20 or 25 signed copies. So if you order tonight, um, you can order it for pickup at the store or to be delivered if you're out of the city or if you've been, if you're in the city and you don't feel comfortable uh, coming out to pick it up, that's cool. You know, we've been using the USPS and uh, we want to thank people for purchasing books from us. And I want to let you know that you can do so uh, if you didn't know that. And definitely get this one, get Wallace's one as well. And I'm gonna turn it over now to Wallace and Kanjwani. Right, you want me to go first or you want, how you want to do it, bro? Um, I mean, I can uh, I can speak a little bit, read something, then you can you can hit me with some questions. All right, like let's, let's, yeah, let's do it like that. So, um, so when I first started writing this book, um, 
But let, let me go back a little bit. So when I first started doing my spoken word and, you know, sharing my stories, um, you know, after my events, I would have people both white and black, you know, who, who don't have any proximity to, you know, poor people in communities like mine and what we go through. And, um, you know, they, they will always say that, uh, you know, my work kind of helped them understand uh, racial inequalities in this country. Right. And they would always ask and say, you know, uh, you know, how do I understand these things that aren't a part of my reality? And, you know, after years and years of hearing this question, you know, I realized that it's not about them understanding that it's not a, like how do they get to understand something that's not a part of their reality. It's about getting them to understand how it is a part of their reality and how these two different worlds are merely two sides of the same coin. Um, you know, Baltimore operates the way it does because people make conscious decisions to fund the highways for white people in the suburbs instead of jobs and education in the city for, for you know, black students. Baltimore operates the way it does because conscious decisions were made to pay out millions of dollars in lawsuits because police can't stop terrorizing the people they're supposed to protect and serve. Um, you know, conscious decision was made to fund the police department and prisons and not build up undeserved black communities. And, you know, it's both white and black Americans who support the construction of more prisons. And they champion, you know, uh, the strategy to add more police on the streets because there's this false fixed image in their minds, you know, uh, about poor black people, you know, that they are highly criminal and that, you know, and, and the eradication of crime will protect their lives and valuables in their suburban homes. You know what I'm saying? And this is something that applies to states, neighborhoods and cities throughout the country. So what I'm writing about in this book and what I'm going to share with you in this introduction is just some of the issues that, you know, people like myself face in these communities all throughout this country. And, you know, um, and just getting people to understand that, you know, that them living their good life isn't an, another reality. Like y'all realities are good. You know what I'm saying? And our realities are bad. Like two things have to exist in order for this country to thrive. Like it wouldn't be a white supremacy or it wouldn't be a white, you know, hierarchy if it wasn't for an ugly nigger, if it wasn't for a, a, a bottom, you know what I'm saying? They need someone to stomp on, they need someone to be ugly in order for them to be beautiful. They need someone, you know, to be extremely poor in order for them to be extremely rich. So um, I'm gonna just kick it off and I'm gonna read something from the intro. He was just a kid. Blue and red lights bouncing off of buildings in the faces of spectators. Yellow tape that the police try to keep you behind. Broken glass lying on a curb from the bottle of blood ice that fell out of the kid's hand. There's a little boy out there who's maybe two years old, laughing and stomping on a bed as if it were a rain puddle. The corner store clerk just finished closing up his shop. He's out there reminiscing on the kid's transition. A toddler who went from toting stuffed barney animals Purchasing honey buns and sunflower seeds for breakfast, which later got swapped out for alcohol and blunts. There's a little girl who's around 12 years old, dressed in SpongeBob printed pajama pants, slippers, and a bonnet. Her tears are crashing the concrete. She's screaming. That's crazy. Niggas be so quick to pick up a gun. Niggas are scared. Don't even want to fight no more. She doesn't realize that this murder has nothing to do with niggas being scared. It's just that niggas are not fools. Niggas got tired of bringing scarred knuckles to gun walls. There's someone's grandmother peeking out of the window blinds, shaking her head in disgust. She's been on this earth in this neighborhood all 70 years of her life. This isn't her first rodeo. Sending prayers to the Lord is the only formula she believes in stopping the chaos in the city. There's a boy pacing back and forth, smoking a new port down till it burns the filter. He's about 14. He has revenge on his tongue because the kid is someone who we looked up to, who we admired. There's people standing around waving cell phones recording the murder scene. That kid's boy will overflow the internet before the night is over. His body will pop up on his mother's Facebook and all of her friends will see it. It will end up on Instagram and Twitter feeds and people will watch, share, then repeat. The video of that kid's body will end up in homes that will never know the feeling of seeing that live. He was just a kid. Blood marinates his scalp and his bulging eyeballs and covers all of his gold teeth. His jaw is sliced in half from the bullet. His shoes are divorced from his feet from the impact of the bullet. 
His pale skin is on a concrete intimate with cigarette butts, band-aids, and rat shit because of the bullet. The kid is gone. He's not coming back. His parents will not raise the rest of their kids the same because that's what trauma does. Sucks energy out of your performance. The children, his friends, and loved ones will not be the same. The people who witnessed the murder will not be the same. The kid is gone. An emotional, spiritual, mental, and future financial backbone is gone. Anyone who has proximity to this kid will not be the same. And even if you don't say it aloud, you wonder, will I be next? I was a kid when I first realized that nothing or no one lasts forever. People leaving was routine. I remember walking home from school and seeing the entire inside furnishings and possessions of my friend's family's home on their front yard. Landlords kicked them out for unpaid rent. I see my parents get handcuffed and escorted to jail and cop cars. Some friends were leaving body bags. Custody battles between two parents on the street always ended up in some kind of physical violence. Heartbreak is why they left. In my neighborhood, leaving was normal and it was always abrupt. It was never like in the movies. No one wrote any notes and explained to people why they left. It wasn't like the workplace. There was no two weeks notice. The adults in my life that held authority positions like teachers and family were gifted at making children believe they knew everything about the world until it was time to discuss departure. No one had the knowledge or the guts to explain why people left or even if they returned. Why so many, get, why so many people get killed in the summertime? I asked my grandmother as a child. She asked me as clear as she could. It was because the summertime heat goes to people's heads, which make them act out of character. Or because children aren't in the school, so now they have more time to get in trouble. Or because people just like to show off. She concluded her monologues, but that's just what happens in the summertime. A lot of niggas die. Summers in Baltimore on old pair of tennis shoes. My parents walked them, I walked them. The tennis shoes are currently on the feet of the youth. Under normal circumstances, if you ride through pretty much any neighborhood in East Baltimore, you'll see packs of kids outside cracking open fire hydrants, eating chicken boxes, standing on corners, scraping frozen sugar out of styrofoam cups with spoons, and watching 12 o'clock boys perform death threatening stunts up and down the block. The old heads were always out there too, playing spades on fold up tables, cans of bud ice yelling about who's the greatest NBA Hall of Famer. It's always a party. It's common for parties to get broken up. I mean, was the party really that popping if it wasn't on the verge of getting broken up and shutting down? Maybe it was because of a fist fight or a neighbor making complaints which prompted the cops to come and close the party down. Whether it was during grade school, high school, or as an undergrad, everyone has attended a function that was broken up. When the party gets broken up by bullets, it's different. Shots ring off and everyone's ducking, screaming, running, or all three. The second the smoke clears, you look around and realize no one was shooting at you or the people you were chilling with. The gun roar was echoing from around the corner. So everyone who has legs run towards the sound of the fire because the gun told us to. The gun is the puppeteer. While running, I'm pretty sure that same thought is on the forefront of everyone's mind. The body will belong to one of us. No matter how fast you run to the scene, the majority of the time the police beat you there because there are one too many in our neighborhood and they stay on the prowl. The summer is now over and the K through 12 school year starts and there will be black boys and girls sitting in same and hot classrooms with no AC, reading from ancient textbooks and on the receiving end of being miseducated and their creativity critical and, and, and analytic thinking will be threatened because of the miseducation and them not being represented in the literature being taught. It eventually goes from hot to cold as soon as the Christmas season, but the lack of heat causes devastation. Bills go unpaid and families use their ovens to heat up their homes and use candles for light, which end up burning down homes and taking away lives. In these houses, kids eat paint chips and are severely affected by lead paint poisoning. And through it all, we have to walk through the streets and keep our head on a swivel because Baltimore police have a long track record of robbing, planting drugs and guns and murdering innocent people. All of this pain comes with my black experience in Baltimore. Toni Morrison said, history is in percentiles. The thoughts of great men and the description of errors. Errors of racism constantly change. 
Our ancestors' era was rife with lynchings, cotton, and black human beings sold for crates of gunpowder and rum. That's how it was taught to me. We live in an era now where we can open an app on our phone, read a Bible scripture, swipe to another app, and see a video of the white killer cop, Derek Chavon, kneeling on George Floyd's neck while he was handcuffed and lying on his stomach for eight minutes, crying for his dead mother until he himself was dead, murdered. In 1901, Theodore Roosevelt wrote to his friend, Owen Wister, an American writer and historian, I entirely agree with you that as a race and in a mass, blacks are altogether inferior to whites. I suppose I should be ashamed to say that I take the Western view of the Indian. I don't go so far as to think that the only good Indians are the dead Indians, but I believe nine out of every 10 are and I shouldn't like to inquire too closely into the case of the 10th. The most vicious cowboy has more moral principle than the average Indian. Roosevelt's quote encompasses why the police of Shelby, North Carolina, could buy the 21-year-old white supremacist Dylan Roof Burger King because he had eaten in a couple of days. This was hours after his arrest for killing nine black churchgoers. And after they can label him very quiet, very calm, and note that he was not problematic. Dylan Roof was an agent of the state carrying out his ancestors' plan, which is to eliminate black life. In, 1970, in, 19, in 1751, Benjamin Franklin wrote the essay, Observations Concerning the Increase of Mankind, Peopling of Countries, etc., where he stated, why increase the sons of Africa by planting them in America where we have so fair an opportunity by excluding all blacks and tawnies of increasing the lovely white and red. Franklin made it clear that he did not want black people in this country, but since we were here, how will we preserve and increase the white population? You create laws and policies that discriminate against the descendants of Africa, black people to do so. You use propaganda to install racist ideas to the masses that will force black people into prison cells and to keep white people out. You have racist policies that will ensure inferior opportunities and circumstances so you can blame them and not the symptoms and not the system that oppresses them. Then you condition them to believe the up by the bootstraps ideology so they will blame themselves for not having and not being afforded the same opportunities that white people have in this country. I didn't know what systemic oppression was and the pain that I suffered was from a product of my era of racism until I was an adult. I didn't believe that mass incarceration was a real thing, although I knew people, including myself, who were arrested in jail for crimes we didn't commit. It was difficult for me to understand that millions of black people got arrested because of an agenda. I knew that the country, that the county and private schools were better than the city schools, but did not know that this was my era of racism. I just always thought that there was something wrong with black people. The pain that I endure without any truthful context as to why that pain exists is what forms and nourishes racist ideas to exist. And I'm going to end right there. Heavy, bro, heavy. Um, and I'm glad you chose the, the intro to kind of like kick this off. Um, I wanted you to talk about your approach to, you know, the book in 2020, right? Um, I said earlier, when we talked earlier, um, you want, I really looked at the book as you know, I, I, want, I really wanted to know how did you approach the book, right? From in the scope of this year, you know what I mean? From a global pandemic that's exposing systematic epidemics within our community, right? To, you know, the black body still being disproportionately murdered and made a, a viral spectacle. Like how did you approach the, the, you know, the topic of race in 2020 on top of approaching that, having that same approach and approaching a book and bringing this book to life? So I would say that every time that I'm writing a book, you know, in the forefront of my mind, I always think, you know, who am I writing for? And aside from myself, it's, you know, for people in, in Baltimore that can access this information and be able to digest this information. So I was interviewing my, my friend, Sharaina Christmas. And in a nutshell, I have an essay uh, about her in my book. I'm um, called Temple is Black, Black Body is Temple. And um, I remember when I was interviewing her, she was telling me, she's from New York, she was telling me that Baltimore 
um, is the epicenter of black progression in this country. She was like, look to Baltimore, see how black people are doing this country, and it's a reflection of how black people, um, if, if you look at if you look at the black people in Baltimore, um, and seeing how they are doing, it's a reflection of how black people are doing this country, right? So when she said that, it really hit me. And um, you know, what other way could I attack, you know, and tackle um, racism and anti-racism uh, without using my personal experiences and the things that's going on around me in this city. So um, that's why, you know, 95% of this book is about Baltimore. It's either about my experiences growing up, what I face now, or, you know, things that I see and, uh, you know, uh, people in Baltimore relations to the world, you know, and um, I feel like that was, that was, you know, my main, my main point uh you know, at the at the beginning stages, I was like, you know, how can I make this strictly about Baltimore, but also, you know, uh, tie in historical context, historical themes, and you know, other incidents that go on in this in in this world, and um, you know, make it make sense. And and you know, I know the importance of storytelling. I used to tell myself all the time that I hated history growing up, um, but it wasn't that I, that I hated history. I was I just hated the way that history was uh, being taught to me. You know what I'm saying? And I realized that a lot, you know, I learned through narrative and storytelling. So um, I know that there's other people who, who, who learn through that. You know what I'm saying? So I just tried to give it to them in that in that way. Mm -hmm. That's powerful. Um, I was fortunate enough to, you know, when you were, you know, when you got to the, the, the skeleton of this book, I was fortunate enough to, you know, see you, you know, develop this book, develop this narrative and really see you bring it together and you know, the final product, man, like especially that intro, that intro you really went in on, um, but the final product and just to see, you know, your friends bring together a project, uh, that's powerful for me. And that's what really makes me, you know, be proud to be a writer. Um, I do have my favorites in the book. I'm gonna let you explain yours, but um, before we do that, my next question is, you know, writing and reading is subjective in the eyes of both the reader and the writer right so if you could have three takeaways that you want your audience right and, and you you know your audience your intended audience and your, your target audience but if you have three takeaways or three aha moments you want your readers to take away from this book what would they be i would say one of the main things is that I want, I, I honestly want people to stop trying to um, police black liberation or any liberation in that in that matter because liberation is nuanced. You know, too many times I hear black, white, whoever say, oh, if you're not doing this, then that's not real black liberation work. And in my mind, I'm like, yo, who the fuck are you to tell somebody else what liberation means for them? You understand what I'm saying? It's the same, it's the same beef that uh, that Malcolm X had with Martin Luther King. Malcolm X was, you know, essentially calling Martin Luther King a coon for how he was attacking racism, you know, down south when he all the way up north. Like, who are you to tell this man what and what not to do? Like, the real thing to do is go to those people and ask them what they truly need and then help them get what they think that they need. And you can, you know, help educate them if you feel like they missing some marks. But we, we shouldn't be here always talking about what a person not doing. You know what I'm saying? Black liberation for some people is just raising their kids. It's putting their kids through through private school so they can get a better education than anybody else in their family ever got. You know what I'm saying? That might be black liberation. And just because they're not on the front lines protesting every day, that don't mean that they don't care about black people. You know, and that, that's just something that I be hearing a lot on the internet and, and in real life, people always quit to tell somebody what they're not doing instead of focusing on what, what people are doing. So I don't understand that, you know, that, that, black, that black liberation it's not a one size fit all end goal for no for no group of people. Um, you know, two, um, I want people to grow stronger in that anti-racism work. And, you know, I want them to read my book and book like Kendi's books and, and your book and D and D's book. And and um, but I want I, I need I need people to understand that just by reading this work does not mean that you've done the work. Like this is just a part of it. You know what I'm saying? Don't be running around saying, yeah, I read the anti-racist, how to be anti-racist. I read Stein from the beginning. I read Joint. Yeah, I read B-Side. I know what's going on. Okay, like, like that's 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 just one part of it. You know what I'm saying? And the work has to come after that. 
So I, I want I want people to realize that you know um, your, your your knowledge got to match you know your actions. Like the Black Lives Matter signs, you know that's on the cover of your of your mental book. You know what I'm saying? Like the content on the inside got to match that cover. And um and again, what I mentioned a little bit. Uh, just now, you know, I, I want people to understand more about what's going on in Baltimore because we never had a good run with the media. You know, we we uh, we never had the luxury to tell our own stories until fairly recently. Or if it was somebody from here, you know, on these national platforms, for the most part, that told our stories, it was always commodified or watered down. You know what I'm saying? It was never honest accounts. So you got a person like myself who, who been here my whole life, like you, like D, and I want people to know more about what's going on in Baltimore. And, um, you know, and, and realize, you know, what Sharana Christmas said, you know, about, um, you know, what, what's going on here is a reflection of what's going on all throughout this country, both good and bad. You know what I'm saying? From the brilliant artists that, uh, you know, don't, don't really get too much mainstream media time, uh, you know, to <laughs> crooked politicians and police who don't even really get out it and, you know, slammed how they're supposed to. Like, there's so many people, so many friends I know that know so much about Baltimore but don't even know about the Gun Trace Task Force and how they got indicted. I'm like, yo, that should have been national news. You know what I'm saying? But it wasn't. So um, that's just that's just something, you know what I'm saying? You know, they're they my three things. Um, which brings me to my next question. Um, and I'm fortunate, I'm blessed. Uh, to be a part of this community that we have here. Like like you said, you mentioned to your homegirl, your homegirl said that, you know, if you want to know anything that's going on in the country for black people, look at Baltimore, right? And I always say this, I think our city is the hub for anything that's dealing with arts. Um, there's so much talent here, so many different artists here. Um, I'm fortunate to be in a community um, where, a community of artists where, you know, if one wins, we all win. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like five years ago, that's when I met you. Um, we was actually doing an event with D of Red Emma's. Uh, you performed, I performed and like we we all been cool and close knit every since for real. So talk about the importance of a community of, of, of building that community of artists. Um, if anybody does it here, I know you and D are really, you know, they like this is this is one of you guys staples here. You know what I mean? Like just bring an artist together, bringing, you know, this person over here might be um, a sketch artist. This person might be a, a photographer, but what you guys do a lot is build that sense of community here in the city. So talk about how important it is to have a sense of community of artists, among, especially black artists, but also for Baltimore City. Talk about that importance. I feel like one thing that we understood um, that a lot of other people don't don't understand is that it's not about wanting to help other artists. It's a need. You know what I'm saying? It's not a want. It's, it's a need. Like in order for us to have something sustainable here, have a, a, a culture that's sustainable, you have to share. You have to give wisdom, you have to give knowledge. That's as ancient as it get. You know what I'm saying? Communities don't build by people hoarding opportunities and access and resources and knowledge. They don't, they pass it down. Even if you look at your family, you know what I'm saying? Stories that have been passed down from generation to generation to generation, and they 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 get you out of trouble. You know what I'm saying? Or get you to understand more about the family. You know what I'm saying? So I feel like D look at it as like it's a need for that, especially in a city where we don't have infrastructures like L.A. We don't got infrastructures like New York. We don't got ABC, NBC. We don't we can't walk to Hollywood. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We can't. So it's like we don't we don't even have like the sustainability, you know what I'm saying, for for artists and, and, and writers in particular. You know what I'm saying? We got the Baltimore Sun, but I mean, what that staff look like? You know what I'm saying? Like, they don't really be hiring people like us, and that's that's no no shade to the sun. That's just all facts. You know what I'm saying? Even even um, you know when 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 City Paper was around, our homeboy Reggie. You know what I'm saying? They they kept him on freelance, and he had to go he had to go to um Boston to get some shine. You know what I'm saying? Shoot for the for the Sox, and then he had to go to the San, San Antonio and shoot for the Spurs. To get some real shine, you know what I'm saying, and for whatever reason they 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 didn't have them on staff, but they just they just two instances of you know 
why we got to stick together because a lot of times these companies and these institutions are not going to be our saviors. You know what I'm saying? We got to be each other's saviors. We got to be there for one another. And D does a good job at that. I remember when I, when I first graduated from Virginia State, came back home, 2015, 2016, started hanging around D. You know, he'd take me up to New York with him. I mean, editors. He would take me to D.C. with him. I'm meeting people, you know, who, who buying books and, you know, uh, funding him to go to different schools in the, in the, in the, in the DMV area. Um, you know what I'm saying? He putting me on stages, plugging me with people. And, um, you know, again, like, like Colin said, when he met me, I was a spoken word poet. And I remember D asked me one day, like, yo, you ever thought about writing essays? And I was like, nah, not for real. I mean, I'm a poet. That's not really my thing. And he compared, uh, you know, writing to basketball. And he was like, yo, imagine, you know, it, it being a basketball court. Yeah, I, uh, so I actually just froze, Colin. Yeah, I think, uh, Kenwan, you, you seem a little frozen there. Um... It took me to, to, the, to the UK, you know what I'm saying? I was in, a, in the UK for about like two, two weeks, you know what I'm saying? I gave lectures at University of London. I went to Birmingham, and, um, you know, that's the importance of that. People, mentors and communities seeing things and, and the people that they love and the people that they look up to and the people that they want to help and pull stuff out of them. And I feel like that's the best part of having a community. Uh, um, I actually just froze. Um, can y'all, I'm still good. All right, I guess right now we can open it up to um, question, questions from the audience. So we, we can do like a Q&A question um, session from the audience. Um, Colin, I, I don't know, are we asking um, them to drop the questions in the chat or how is that working? You want to moderate that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know if there are any questions, but definitely for anyone who is watching uh, right now, if you have any questions, we can uh, take them and uh, have Kandwani address them. We got, we got a few minutes for that. Might I, let me, um, while, while we're waiting for some questions to show up, but let me uh, just ask some, uh, something technical, uh, Kandwani. Um, you know, this is, as I mentioned, you know, you had two, um, Two books that you published yourself, and this is the first one, uh, you know, with a major publisher. It's uh, Hot Books, and it's distributed by Simon and Schuster, so that's pretty major. Um, you know, how how you how you felt about just that process? I mean, maybe that's something that that people would like to hear about uh, a little bit. Real, real quick, am I froze? Yeah, you, I got you. Okay. But yeah, I would I would say that um it's just a long time coming. You know what I'm saying? I've been I've been wanting a book deal for the longest. Um, the one thing that I can tell, like I thought that I was, I was saying that I. And you know, the one thing that all of those people that I mentioned had in common is that, you know, mm. I completed this one, you know, I definitely wanted to do well. I want to, I want to see how it resonates with people you know, outside of my world because, Colin, you know, like in order, you know, for people to have my books in their stores in Baltimore, so I got to have some type of relationship with them. I like the description and buy it. 
because one thing I can say, a lot of people that support my work, a lot of people that buy my books is because they're familiar with Kondwani, the person first, and then they like get enchanted by my writing. sense yeah i i think unfortunately i think we lost a little bit of your answer i apologize for that um but uh you know thanks for that did uh did any questions come through on the chat Um, no questions on the chat. I don't see any questions on the chat. I mean, I I had some questions. I I, I can keep it. I can keep asking. Yeah, and I you know since it, we do seem to be having some connectivity issues, so like maybe let's do try to do two more questions. Um, you know, hopefully, uh, hopefully the internet gods will be more forgiving, <laughs> and uh, and then we could just close it out for the night again with the plug. But yeah, no, I'm going to go to the questions, but I'm just going to plug this right now as well. Again, get this. I also wanted to uh, mention uh, something that Kondwani did uh, in the weeks leading up to his release, which was the anti-racist challenge, uh, getting this book into the hands of uh, public school students. And, um, you know, that, that was something where uh, he, it was both at, something great for independent bookstores. He encouraged people to buy the book from independent bookstores and then match a copy uh, to go to public school students. So I want to just shout that out and uh, thank you for that as well. Uh, but yeah, if you have another question, Wallace, go, re go right ahead. All right. So um, I, I pretty much was going to ask you, bro, to really just explain, because um, I, I feel like one of your your strengths as a writer. And I, I tell you this all the time, bro, like your ability to play on a title, your ability to uh, create a title, you know what I mean? Um, so just talk about, you know, the anti-racism, that's a, that's a strong, a strong statement, right? If I'm going in a bookstore and I see the anti-racism, that's a strong statement. I'm gonna pick it up, you know what I mean? But talk about, talk about the subtitle, you know what I mean? The subtitle, in my opinion, is strong. It's probably the strongest thing on the front cover. Talk about, you know, what, the, how significant and how important that subtitle is. How to start a conversation on race. So one thing that I, because I, the publishing company, they was they was going for, because you know my titles be creative, and they wanted to go towards something that people could understand what was happening in a book just by reading it, just by reading the title. Like if my, my book be full of hummingbirds in the trenches, you really have no clue about that. That book could go in any direction. You know what I'm saying? So I'm like, okay, cool. So I was just thinking about the content of my work, the context of my work, you know what I'm saying? Which is like all of us, you know, essentially talk about being anti-racist and, you know, speaking about racism. So um, in my epigraph, uh, I got an epigraph and, you know, anti-racist. I got a quote by Gil Scott Heron. And he said, the first change that takes place is in your mind. You have to change your mind before you change the way you live and the way you move. The thing that's going to change people is something that nobody will ever be able to capture on film. It's just something that you see and you'll think, oh, I'm on the wrong page, or oh, I'm on the right page, or the wrong note. And I got to get in sync with everyone else to find out what's happening in the country. You know what I'm saying? And a lot of times people downplay uh, knowledge or it happening in the mind. You know what I'm saying? Because people always follow up and be like, oh, well, you don't do anything. But it's like everybody process is different. Like I said, I'm being clear. And I'm, and, I, and, I, and I'm saying, like, yeah, reading isn't the end all be all. But some people just don't know what's going on. You know what I'm saying? And that's and like, listen, bro, I'm, I'm, I grew up in Baltimore. I got my ass beat by the police. I got locked up for shit that I did not do. And as a 22 year old black male who went through that, I did not believe that mass incarceration was a thing. How is that? 
somebody was telling me that spent like 17 years in jail was telling me it's a agenda to lock people up. I'm like, nah, man, all the people I know, they did dumb shit and they got locked up. Like, I'm not believing that, right? Because I didn't know no better. So what makes you think that a 40 year old, 50 year old, 60 year old white man in the middle of Wisconsin somewhere going to believe that mass incarceration is a thing when propaganda and, and, and everybody that came before us was telling us something different? You know what I'm saying? So understanding here is way important before the, it, it got to come before the action. You know what I'm saying? Like you think and then do. You feel me? So that's why, you know, that subtitle, how to start the conversation about race and take action. And I feel like it's important. They, they, they go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other because you got some people that's going to act on things that they don't really know nothing about and they're going to end up in a, in, a, in a messed up spot. You know what I'm saying? So that change got to happen here first, you know what I'm saying? Like being conscious of what's going on is a huge part, but you got to apply that consciousness, you know what I'm saying? Or, or everything you know just going to be null and void at that point. Facts. Big facts. Um, it looks like we have a question uh, posted in the chat. Um, Where have y'all seen these questions at? Oh, I see one. <laughs> you see it? Oh, yeah, so it's a black author from Baltimore with, with a specific narrative you have shared through your writing various times what personal obstacles have you had to overcome when it concerns you um, Troy Mars like you have the ability to be a writer and not diving into any possible personal doubts that could arise in the artistic career such as the author slash poet so if we talking about like artistic career um like I do, I do have doubts at times. You know what I'm saying? Um, I've been through at probably any emotion you can think of. Like I done been through it. Like I done been depressed. I done felt suicidal at times. I done felt down and out. I felt like, you know what I'm saying? Like I felt lonely, you know what I'm saying? And these emotions that occur uh, frequently, you know what I'm saying? And And I just, I just, you know, I, I have my days where where I, I live in that and live in those emotions, and then I have those days where I fight through it. And I know I always look at it like shit. If I give up writing, then what am I gonna do? Like I'm literally like this is all I have, and that's how I that's how I view it. Like I don't have anything else. Like this is it. You know what I'm saying? And I and I realize you know that, that a lot of people look to me like they seek refuge in my work. They seek refuge in seeing me post on social media. They seek refuge in some of the stuff that I do. So that's another thing that, that that just keep my head on straight. And again, like I said earlier, like you just can't give up. Like I made it this far, like it would be dumb if I gave up. You know what I'm saying? And then give up and do what? But yeah, I, I you know, I definitely deal with those emotions constantly, especially living in Baltimore, especially knowing, you know what I'm saying? Every other week, you, you know somebody that get killed or you know somebody that know somebody that got killed or that get locked up you know what i'm saying and then on top of that you know uh you know police violence throughout this country is just magnified and you know everything everything you know is just going viral like you see somebody get blown up in france then somebody get shot in the head in wisconsin then somebody get beat up in mexico then you know what i'm saying it's a mass shooting in dc a kid get killed you know what i'm saying so you got to deal with all of that too so it's like all these emotions, bro, and I'm and I'm pretty sure, you know what I'm saying. Every everybody, you know, feel that way, um, you know, to a certain extent about you know the the the, the ills that's going on in the world, and you know our relationship to these ills, you know, it being so broadcasted, and I'm pretty sure that that adds to a lot of people depression, and you know what I'm saying, and yeah, the yeah, feelings that they go through, like a social media overload, like all the stuff that. So, you know, it's a, it's a, I don't think we was built. I don't think we was built to to know this much information about what's going on in the world, bro. We wasn't like I was even saying like how you know people tell me like yeah you gotta keep one foot in the revolution, one foot out the revolution. But nowadays it's so hard because everything is just on your phone screen and people sending you stuff, tagging you and stuff, and you see people getting their heads beaten literally every day, or you see people showing that fake support every day. And like, what, did, what does that do to us psychologically? You know what I'm saying? And emotionally and spiritually, you feel me? Like before, like you had to, you know, my grandmother was, I mean, when I was coming up, like 
to know what's going on in the world, you had to actively read the newspaper, actively cut on the television. And now we're on our phones every day, all day, and everything that's going on in the world is just right there. And I feel like that's that's not healthy for nobody. Facts. Facts. Um, we got another question, and the question basically says, what advice do you have for new, for a new unknown artist in Baltimore attempting to assert themselves in a Baltimorean artist community that is already well formed and includes persons filled with familiarity? I would say that, you know, I, I can I can speak on how I became a part of, you know, the Baltimore artist community. Cause I'm from Baltimore, but I didn't know that the artist community even existed. I, I you know what I'm saying? But what I did was I just found out, you know, some poetry shows that was going on. I hit the stages. I got acquainted to people. And mind you, they already had this community long before I became a part of it. But I just I just showed up. You know what I'm saying? They had events. I performed. I, I, I think I did well. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, um, I, I showed them respect, you know, and I just I just, you know, every day was just becoming a better, uh, uh, you know, a better artist. I was trying to. And when I hit these events, you know what I'm saying? I, I was just doing everything. Like I'm at events performing. It would be some nights where I, I would perform at three different events. I go there, I do my thing. I drop my social media handle. I tell people that I got a book on the way. I'm not even nowhere near close to finish my book. Tell them I got a book on the way. I'm on YouTube, dropping videos. I'm on the internet building community, just, sh just showing love. You know what I'm saying? And people will show the love back and vice versa. But I would say just, just, just go out there and get acquainted with people with people because the internet is, is not it. The internet is an extension of who we are. You know what I'm saying? Like the um like the dude, the dude DJ Flow, he always say like uh the internet is cluttered, but the streets is wide open. You know what I'm saying? Like the, the streets is where is that the people is where is that that's how you gonna form that community. Not by, you know, just shooting people DMs or liking their pictures or like if they have an event, I mean it's COVID now, but like if they have an event, like pull up to the event and holler at them. You know what I'm saying? They doing something like just pull up and holler at them. Like that don't that don't cost nothing. Um, Cause again, the internet is just an extension. So you gotta just talk to real people in real time and build real connections. Right. So I, I mean, I would definitely say that also. Um, when I got when I jumped on the scene, you know, I was checking out open mics. You know, I was checking out open mics. I was hitting readings. You know, like I I was just trying to build that network and just really just put my so hey, go out I'm I'm you hear me now I'm I'm there yeah you been out a little bit this is Wi-Fi this Wi-Fi phony in here <laughs> But no, it, it's just uh, it's just really putting yourself out there, getting out on the scene, getting out there in front of people, building networks, um, and just really putting in that work behind closed doors because it definitely shows. Uh, I think we can do one more question. All right, what are your views on the concept of allyship? In the process of trying to unpack everything that is going on, I feel like people are quick to say that an al that they're an ally. But to me, it's the modern day. I'm not sure is this a, is his, his name or... Day, it's the modern day of them telling me, because I think they caught me in and pasting it, so it's going right. right. Okay, it's the modern, modern day of them. Uh, we lost your audio again there. I can, do, I can just answer it for real. I can, I can see yeah. it. Do you mind just saying the saying the question aloud so that um, the people who aren't reading the chat can can hear? Say it again. Oh, we just lost your audio again, Wallace. And um, I just I just want to make sure that the people who are are watching but can't uh, aren't aren't seeing the chat can can hear the question. Right. Um, can you hear me now? I'm good. Yeah. yeah. All right, so you want you? I mean, y'all want me to repeat, or you want to go in and just ask for it, Connie? I mean, I could, I could just. Uh, I mean, the second part, um, because we heard the first part, but the second part we miss is, um, you know, uh, 
people are quick to say they're an ally, but to me, it's the modern day of them telling me that some of their best friends are black, are that positive environment of allyship that you've seen on your end. I would say that um, what allies need to understand is that I feel like there's a few things. Like a, a, a lot of people want to just say that they allies and which will, uh, which I will say, it gives them less responsibility to take charge, if that makes sense. It's like, you know, out of all of the ways that you can help people, the easiest thing that you can do is just go out and protest with a Black Lives Matter sign when it's like already 80,000 people out there. You know what I'm saying? But it's like, how you treat him, like how, how are you valuing Black life in your, in your all white neighborhood? Are you, are you making it comfortable for people to, to live there? You know what I'm saying? Like, what are you doing? Like, like how you just mentioned, like, what are you doing behind closed doors? And like, what's your receipts looking like? Like, what are you doing in real life? You know what I'm saying? And a lot of people, we got social media now, so stuff just gets so tricky. Like, you can take some cool pictures, you can have a nice amount of followers, you can get retweets and likes, and you can, you know, uh, activate yourself as, you know, the hegemonic, uh, uh, you know, revolutionary Black Lives Matter activist. Like, you can be all of that just by some fucking tweets. You know what I'm saying? So if you got people who are Black doing that, then I can only imagine, you know, what the allies are doing. Like, they ain't no, they, you know, on that same time. But I would say the allies need to realize that, like, you know, don't ever feel like that you're doing uh, the marginalized group that you're supporting a favor. Like once you feel like that you're doing them a favor, everything else go out the window. Like it's not no favor. You should be doing this work because it's the work that you want to do. Now, like, wow, I'm, I'm doing this for them because they they need this. No, you should be doing it because it's the right thing to do. And um, have I seen any allyship on my end? Um, so, so for example, right? It's this it's this this old white lady. Her name Pari Hooks, and she based out of like the D.C. area. And um. What she does is she has this organate this organization where she um pays artists and she um buys people she she buys books like so she'll buy like seventy five copies sometimes fifty sometimes twenty sometimes a hundred copies of my books right and she'll pick, she'll buy my book she'll also give me an honorarium um to go speak at a school in a DMV area. You know what I'm saying? So these schools, they get a free creative writing workshop. They get to meet the author that they teach us. You know, they put they put my work in the curriculum, and and stuff like that. And I get paid, and I get my books out there. You know what I'm saying? And she don't really know too much about what's going on in like black cars. Like she's like, and if you talk to her, you can you can just see that she's just a nice old white lady. She don't know shit about nothing. But with her platform, what she like to do. She likes literature. She likes books. And you know what I'm saying? And she feel like this is how, you know, I can use my my platform. And this is like ally shit for me. You know what I'm saying? She's not out here. She ain't got Black Lives Matter tattooed on her arm. You know what I'm saying? She's not out here at the protest. But she help out the best way that she know how for real. And that's another thing that I mentioned in my book, Anti-Racist, right? You got to look at your privilege. You got to look at your resources, what you have access to. And we all have privilege. We all have access to, to resources. And we gotta see um, how can we, uh, you know, give these things to people who are not afforded. You know what what, what we have, and um, that's like one of the main stepping stones on you know how to help, how to get back, how to find your purpose, and you know how to define allyship. I feel like all of those things you know can start small, opposed to you know saying like, oh, how do I help? Like, what are you good at? What do you have access to? That's how you can start out helping. You know what I'm saying? Like, if I say okay. You say, oh, how can I help? And I say, hey, some kids over here that need to be taught photography, but you never picked up a camera before. So now, you know what I'm saying? Then you'll be like, oh, well, you ain't gonna have nothing to say. So it's like, you just gotta identify, man, what you good at, what you, or what you into, you know what I'm saying? And, and just make it work the best way that you know how, and then just keep growing, keep getting better. Because being, being anti-racist, it's not a, a one-stop shop. It's like a, a eternal, uh, you know, um, interrogation of yourself, reevaluation of yourself, and it's just a long life commitment to growth. Facts, and I was going to say that too. Um, 
allyship is, is is you pointing out your resources, but it's also a genuine thing. Um, I think you can attest to this too, Connie. Um, yeah. You're seeing a lot of things like, you know, from the Joyce Floyd situation unfold, allyship seemed watered down to me. I don't know if it was just me, but it just like had hell just like white corporations and you know, the white mass was unveiled and everybody was all of a sudden an ally. So, you know, I mean, could you agree with that? I mean, is that is that a fair statement fair statement to say, um ally? I would, I would, Go ahead. Bro, real quick, I would say, yeah, because even if you look at Black Lives Matter, right? We went from a time like listen, in 2015. When Freddie Gray was murdered, nobody rocked with Baltimore except Baltimore. Obama even got on stage and called the people who was uprising thugs. Five years later, now this man's showing his support, you know, for the for the for for the people who getting murdered by police. He doing it because it's the cool thing to do right now. And that's a lot of people. That's a lot of feel like they missed out on a chance back then to for to, to be at the, the, the top of their propaganda and to keep their business afloat and the, the fake support. Like the fake support do as much as the 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 brutality. You know what I'm saying? If we being honest, like imagine living in a world, right? Like we don't have to matter, but imagine living in a world where police will 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 murder somebody that look just like you and get away with it. They say that oh we're gonna do an investigation because we care. They get investigated by their friends. You got people like Nancy Pelosi with Kente clubs nailing on TV saying that they saying Black Lives Matter. Every Pick time you know, <laughs> the, the NFL saying Black Lives Matter, NBA saying Black Lives Matter, it's on every billboard and in front of the BMA, they got Black Lives Matter. But how many racist people that, how many racist people artwork that they got in there? You know what I'm saying? How many black people on y'all staff? So it's like, it'd it be kind of bullshit at the end of the day. And it is people who really do care, you know what I'm saying? And I, and I also do understand how important and how vital picking and choosing what side you are, what repping with side you are. Even if you look at the Black Panther Party, right? You had the people who was on the front lines with the guns and you had the people who was just rocking with them. Even those people who was rocking with them was getting harassed by the police. They was getting followed home. They was getting thrown in jail. So even allies, white, black, whoever, our allies are putting themselves in some kind of dangerous position at the end of the day. That's one thing that I can't say because Baltimore is like a, a gang, you know, organizational based country. And it's like, you either with us or you with them, or even if you don't say you with us, then you kind of on the fence. So we just going to like say that you with them. So like symbolism does matter. It really does. You know what I'm saying? Like it's, it's white people that get beat up too for yelling Black Lives Matter. So symbolism does matter, but it can't stop at the symbolism. Like symbolism is important in this country, in this world that we live in, yes, it's important. But the thing is a lot of people feel like it stopped there and it do not stop there. Like you gotta, you gotta, you gotta rock out with that your whole, not, and I'm not saying, you know what I'm saying, your whole life gotta be political, but if you run around saying Black Lives Matter, then how are you really showing that Black Lives Matter? That's all I'm saying. Nice. Yes, All right. So um, let's, uh, I think we can end it there. I think that was a great way to, to wrap it up, really. Um, and I want to thank uh, Wallace. I want to thank you so much for hosting this and, uh, and uh, asking questions for Kondwani. And I hope we can do something for you on your next book. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm I'm dropping um I'm dropping in January, so I'm I'm at that process Connie was at like a few months ago. Um, so yeah, so be on the lookout. Um, my book is at Red Emma's. Um, I am you can follow me on Instagram at Wally Cool. Uh, that's W A L L Y K O O L. Um, and yeah, I'm I I'm looking forward to it. And uh, just again, we've got signed copies at the store, so you can order them, check the link. It's gonna be in either the chat or the description, maybe both. And um, I wanna thank Kanjwani and congratulate him again on this book and uh, look forward to the paperback release and then thank the next one. Thank you, man, appreciate y'all.